Hello, good morning for everyone out there today. Thank you for joining our webinar on the Waste Reduction Network. Uh, we're just gonna give folks a little bit more time, one more minute to put, possibly log in and then we'll get started. My name is Bruce Long and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Great. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, welcome to our Waste Reduction Network, uh, part of the Summer Series webinars. Uh, we've got an exciting lineup for you all today, and uh, we hope you'll get a lot out of it as well. Um, the webinar will provide some of the latest actionable insights from industry experts, partners, and other folks uh, that, uh, that work on sustainability uh, to help accelerate decarbonization, energy efficiency, and sustainable uh, manufacturing and, and living. Uh, today's webinar is called the Turning Waste into Wealth Sustainable Food Management Strategies. Uh, before we dive in, uh, there are a couple of uh, housekeeping points I'd like to cover. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and will be archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, we will follow up when today's recording and slides are made available with all who are interested. Also, uh, attendees are in listen-only mode, so your microphones are muted. If you experience any audio or visual issues during the webinar, please send a message to the Q&A box located at the bottom of the Zoom panel and our tech support team will address it. So, uh, Next slide, please. So, wanted to just uh, touch base on all the companies that are in the, uh, the, the Waste Reduction Network. Uh, we have a lot of good partners in there. Uh, we are growing, so there's still room for companies that are interested if they have a waste reduction program or a goal, or if they want to develop a waste reduction program and goal, we can definitely accommodate them. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, you know, uh, partition between both uh, manufacturing, industrial, and commercial uh, buildings partners. Uh, so uh, come one, come all. Next slide, please. My name is Bruce Long. I'm a senior technical advisor for Lindahl Reed, and I'll be serving as the moderator today. Uh, next slide, please. Want to just quickly let you know who all is on the team for the Waste Reduction Network. Uh, so in addition to myself, uh, Sarah Stubbs from the Building Technologies Office is an ORIS fellow, also helps support and lead the team. Uh, we have a lot of great support from Jasmine Schmidt at ICF, Julia Cox at Retech Advisors, and also we have technical support from Savod Chowdhury at the Oak Ridge National Lab, who is a waste expert. Next slide, please. Before we dive into the uh, actual presenters today, we wanted to give you all some information uh, from our colleagues at the Energy, um, I'm sorry, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. Uh, they do a lot of great work on a lot of areas, including waste reduction. And in one case, they do have a team that focuses on food waste um, and also does some work on anaerobic digestion related to uh, food waste or waste streams from, from food production. So one of the things that they've uh, updated uh, and put out there is this wasted food scale. It basically gives you an idea of how to prevent food from being wasted in the first place, but also it goes through a different series of steps and situations in which you can either uh, try to reuse or donate or you know maybe make some food waste streams go towards some kind of waste energy uh, situation. Uh, the landfill is probably the least west, best option, and it kind of shows you all the things you can do up until uh, having to do that. Um, so we definitely encourage you all to find uh, to go to the website here and look at the wasted food scale. There's a whole lot more, more information than just the scale. There's a new report that just came out, um, a lot of tips and, and techniques and stuff like that. So we definitely encourage you all to, to look at that. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the wasted food scale and the work that they do in there, the EPA has come up with a newer version of what they call the waste reduction model. So this is a software tool uh, that can help you calculate, you know, potential savings in waste, energy, and so forth, uh, dealing with uh, you know, waste reduction. Um, a lot of companies are using it to quantify the greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions associated with waste activities, uh, comparing greenhouse gas emissions of different activities, and a lot of modeling of different scenarios based on how you uh, achieve waste reduction and stuff like that. So uh, it'll prompt you for some information and also generate some you know, actionable results. 
Um, we also have the web uh, site for it right here. So we definitely encourage folks who are interested to, to go ahead and, and use it. So uh, next slide, please. And there are some additional waste reduction resources that have been updated uh, from our colleagues at EPA. Uh, frequently asked questions, uh, the Better uh, the Energy Star Buildings page, similar to our Better Buildings uh, program, and then managing and reducing waste. Uh, that's the new report I mentioned. It's the guide pretty much for commercial buildings, but it may have some applicability outside of it as well. Uh, and then conversion factors for waste, so you can understand you know, if you have a certain amount of some kind of waste stream, like a wood residue, what that would translate into, into the energy content uh, that you could get from a waste energy scenario, for example. So, so thank you very much for, for listening to this. Uh, we definitely encourage folks to visit these websites, access this, these resources, and hopefully it will help you all uh, in, in your waste reduction uh, journey. So next slide, please. Today's agenda, uh, we're kind of in the welcome introduction part, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, we're going to go into two uh, speaker presentations. Uh, we have some really great speakers lined up today, and then we'll have some time for Q&A and uh, a wrap-up uh, session at the very, very end. So next slide, please. Uh, for this particular webinar, we use Slido, uh, so we definitely encourage everyone to go to slido.com and enter the DOE code, hashtag DOE. And then it'll put you into a kind of a virtual room where you'll be able to comment or ask questions and like different questions and stuff like that. So uh, definitely uh, we encourage you all to do that. So uh, next slide, please. So today's presenters, we've got two great presenters from two great partners. Um, I'll just uh, introduce both of them real quick and then uh, we can launch into the, the presentations. Uh, first off, we'll have Ms. Lacey Moore from Lundberg Family Farms. Uh, Lacey is the sustainability manager for Lundberg Family Farms and has been with the company for about four years. She has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science uh, to Applied Ecology specifically, and she manages Lundberg's Zero Waste Policy, True Zero Waste Certification, as well as Energy Efficiency Projects and Energy Star Certification. Uh, she also works on climate and life cycle analyses and helps find innovative, innovative sustainable packaging solutions for the company. So thank you very much, Lacey. Uh, next, I'll just introduce Katie Robbins who is with Whole Foods. Uh, Katie unofficially started her career in a dumpster, um, auditing waste through a small sustainability consulting company based in Connecticut. Uh, then she went on to bigger and better things and graduated from Tulane University, where she worked, and she worked as an account manager at River Road Waste Solutions, where she worked with their clients and haulers nationwide to achieve operational efficiency and maximize waste reduction. As the first zero waste manager for Boston University, Katie led the development of the zero waste plan and developed a transformative resource management style waste contract for that university. Um, in 2022, Katie joined Whole Foods Market as the first senior program manager for diversion, where she develops and implements company-wide waste reduction and diversion strategy and programs. So definitely want to thank you all for being with us today and hand it off to Lacey Moore. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for the introduction, Bruce. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I do wanna introduce everybody to Lundberg Family Farms, if you have not heard of us before. Um, we are a vertically integrated rice company. We grow rice, we dry and store it, process and mill it, package it, and manufacture things like rice cakes and boxed rice products, among other things. Lundberg is indeed a family company. The family came to Ridgevale, California in 1937 in the wake of the Dust Bowl, bringing along their tractor and transitioning to rice farming. And from the get-go, the company has intended to be in partnership with nature every step of the way. Next slide. Environmental stewardship is a pillar of our company and a part of our strategy. It really encompasses our commitment to soil, ecosystem, and watershed health, while also promoting biodiversity and reducing environmental impacts on all fronts. This does extend beyond the fields and carries into our manufacturing operations. We want to have substantiated environmental footprints to understand our quantitative impact, including full company scope one, two, and three emissions, but also understanding our impact from a life cycle analysis perspective. And to circle back to Bruce's introduction, we do use tools like the WARM model to understand our impact of diverting waste. Next slide. And you could say that we're green from the ground up. I could talk forever about energy management, climate analyses, et cetera, but today we will be talking about waste. 
And as a food a food manufacturing and farming company, I will say that I can't tell our story about food waste without telling our entire zero waste journey. So bear with me. Next slide. I have a quick poll for you guys. Um, I am interested to know how much waste do you think the average American produces per year? Okay, I got some variability here. Looks like we got a few answers still trickling in. We can go ahead and close it. So it looks like the majority of folks think that it is three times. Um, second coming one and a half times, which is correct. Um, so we can lead into the next slide and I'll give you some context on why I asked you this question. <laughs> so where we are at now. Last year, we had a facility diversion rate of 95.3% and a company waste diversion of 99.6%. Now this is where food comes into play. You'll notice that we have two different diversion metrics and facility waste includes all of our industrial waste from our manufacturing facility, employee break rooms, et cetera. But when we want to include rice, when we want to include rice byproducts, like rice holes, bran, broken rice, and feed, this goes up to 99.6%. So we really like to give perspective. These materials are diverted and sold for animal feed, animal bedding, and ingredients, and things like that. And since the average American does produce about 1.5 to 2 tons of waste per year, our total landfill volume was 41.5 tons last year, which is equivalent to about 30 American waste in a year. But how exactly did we get here? Next slide, please. So we began tracking waste metrics in the 2000s regarding what we are sending to the landfill, the byproducts we were selling, et cetera. Well, it wasn't until 2008 that we got our first mixed recycling bins. We are about 15 miles from the nearest city and in a town with a population of about 200 people. So that is when our waste journey truly kicked off by separating our materials. Our first company waste audits took place in 2011 to identify our diversion opportunities. We completed surveys to assess employee knowledge and understand any gaps that we could address in training. And with the construction of our new administration building during this time, our team members became responsible for sorting their own waste in our office. In 2013, we did reach a diversion rate of 80 88% after finding vendors who were willing to take things like flexible plastics, spice pouches, and glass jars. And this is really when we started to think about the true zero waste certification, which requires a 90% diversion minimum. In 2014, we reached that 90% at a previously set five-year goal. And in 2015, we reached a 92% diversion. We also enacted an official zero waste policy for the company and began annual audits to continue finding those opportunities to divert recyclables, compostables, and other organic materials. And in 2015, we reached a 94.1% facility and 99.6% company diversion rate. Next slide, please. We also joined a garment recycling program for things like nitrile gloves and started pur purchasing larger cases of gloves and other materials to reduce waste. Um, all of those small activities do add up. In 2016, we started using scrap cases for store pickups, gift baskets, changing pallet wrap materials, switching to electronic kiosks and e-boards to reduce our paper use, reducing our hazardous waste and the number of light fixtures, by changing to LED. We joined a uniform recycling program and be 
started to take food waste to an anaerobic digestion facility. And through all of these efforts, we did achieve the true zero waste certification and a 95% diversion rate in 2016, and we have maintained it since. Our next focus really was honing in on food scrap coming off of our manufacturing lines and also scrap packaging. In 2017, we started bulk recycling, and we also started a used equipment inventory, which, help all, which helped all departments finding parts and also identifying appropriate reuse or recycling options here. However, in 2017, China's national sword policy came into play that banned the United States from exporting waste as we had for years, and we simply don't have the same infrastructure for waste management in the U.S., and so this greatly reduced the rebates that were helping to support our sustainability program. And we worked closely with waste haulers and purchased additional balers to separate materials and reduce the chance of contamination. In 2018, we established our resource recovery center to help solidify all of our waste handling and management. And in 2020, we partnered with TerraCycle for a consumer facing flexible packaging program and scrap food materials and packaging aren't our only concern. It really is also the end of life of our packaging and products as well. Next slide, please. Wanted to give visibility to the number of waste streams that we have separated in our facility. Uh, we maintain our diversion rates by separating these waste streams as much as possible. This is reducing the possibility of contamination and increasing our ability to get rebates from vendors or customers who want specific materials. Next slide. So another poll question here, um, true or false? Does changing a manufacturing process or equipment have the ability to reduce food waste? Okay, probably a couple more seconds here. Looks like the majority was sitting with true, which is the correct answer. And I will give some examples of our experience with that. Um, next slide, please. So Waste diversion does present a lot of opportunities and challenges. So let's start with talking about opportunities. Something to look carefully at is reusing or reducing scrap material. And one example is that we really honed in on the pressure and moisture of our rice before it is popped into our rice cakes to minimize the amount of scrap coming from our rice cake manufacturing. And we also use broken rice after it is milled to manufacture our mini rice cakes. Continuous audits are also helpful. We check all bins in our facility daily and we do a complete audit annually. And I actually came to this webinar after supporting our teams and setting up collection bins for our annual landfill audit taking place this week. Collection starts today and we will sort through all materials on Friday. This really helps us to understand any root cause of contamination and gives us the ideas of things to divert. And one of the opportunities we have every year is to educate our employees and continue to find the most effective solutions are for food scraps and not readily composted, which are not readily composted in our area. Another thing you can do is change materials. We have changed ingredients or even ingredient application processes in the past to reduce food scraps. One example is when we were still manufacturing our strawberry cheesecake rice cakes, we ended up choosing to mix the chocolate and strawberries after learning that the topical application of the strawberries was producing a lot of scrap. And you can also work to localize your vendors and customers. It is really difficult to divert food waste, especially if you're somewhere like us, and we actually don't have an industrial composting facility near us. 
we do work with a local anaerobic digestion plant that does bring natural gas back into our local systems. But this journey does not come without challenges. The waste industry is relatively volatile. Certain contamination levels are accepted at certain vendors, but usually that's about 1% of contamination in our supply chain. And this includes food waste. Thinking about things like grit, animal products, and other organic materials that you'd like to divert. It's important to recognize that the waste industry is subject to supply and demand when it comes to vendors interested in certain waste streams. The national sword policy and COVID really showed these challenges to vendors in our network, impacting their market and operations and closing some businesses. So sometimes finding vendors, especially for funky materials, is difficult. Funny enough, rice is something that we have a hard time ridding of if we have to, because something like anaerobic digestion uses so much water to break down rice. And of course, obtaining rebates for your efforts is helpful, but finding the right vendor is not always easy, especially if you're trying to localize your supply chain. And with all of these things considered, ensuring team members are up to date on any changes is complex, uh, with our company being around 450 people and having collection processes change relatively often, but it is a company effort. Next slide. Okay, another poll question. True or false, does packaging play a role in reducing food waste? Seeing all the same answers so far. Okay, looks like we can probably go to the next slide there. All right, well, as you folks know, uh, packaging does have a role in food waste too. So we are always looking for more sustainable options, but with a focus on the quality and integrity of our product, we really want to make sure that our products don't become food waste, if not in a hardy enough material. It is unfortunately no secret that flexible plastics have been the best to uphold our product, but obviously not the front of reducing emissions and using sustainable materials. And of course, as a food manufacturing facility, we want to think about the end of life of our products. With the food part hopefully being in your belly, we also want to find the best end of life for that packaging. Next slide. And as I said earlier, we did partner with TerraCycle to improve the end of life of our hard to recycle materials while we work towards a more sustainable packaging solution. Next slide. So if you ask us, our mission goes back to Albert Lundberg's commitment to leave the land better than you found it. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Lacey. And now we've got Katie Robbins from Whole Foods. So go ahead, Katie, when you're ready. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thanks, Lacey, for that great presentation. So exciting to see all you all are doing at Lundberg. Really incredible. I am such a big fan of the TRUE program and to, to see it in action and doing so well, um, it's just really inspiring. So thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katie Robbins. I am our Senior Program Manager of Diversion at Whole Foods Market. Um, based down here in Austin, Texas at our headquarters. I'm on our sustainability team and I've been with the company for about two and a half years. Um, next slide, please. And I'll be talking to you all a little bit about today, uh, our food waste reduction and diversion strategy at Whole Foods Market. Next slide, please. Uh, some quick context before we get into the good stuff. Uh, I wanted to ground us in the sustainability strategy at Whole Foods. Um, so we have five key focus areas, uh, responsible sourcing, carbon climate, water, waste and packaging, human capital or people impact and transparency reporting and engagement. Um, this gives us a really holistic strategy to look at all components of sustainability within our business and within our, um, supply chain, um, and for our customers as well. Uh, responsible sourcing is nothing new for Whole Foods Market, right? This is um, our quality standards, which is the foundation of what makes us unique as a company. I think things like um, our organic grocer certification, um, our organic products, 
uh, ingredient bans, sourcing standards, animal welfare, all that stuff that's been happening since the beginning, um, it, we are now recognizing as part of a, a larger sustainability strategy under responsible sourcing. Um, climate, carbon, and water, also not, nothing new that we've been taking action on, but um, we have a, alongside Amazon, a uh, net carbon zero goal by 2040. Um, so all of the good stuff that happens in that area is under this pillar of our work. Um, waste and packaging, that's me. Um, I lead the development and implementation of uh, waste reduction and diversion strategy, as well as our packaging sustainability and improvement strategy. Um, of course, alongside many other uh, folks within the business. Human capital or people impact. This is really looking at our suppliers, the relationship we have with them, how we're supporting them being successful at their business and, um, and them having a positive impact on the land. And then transparency reporting and engagement is really a, it's a way of working, right? We seek to be, um, uh, re redefine the standards of how transparent retailers um, are and engage our, everyone from our suppliers to our team members at Whole Foods to our customers in the work that's happening um, with sustainability at Whole Foods. Next slide, please. Um, so of course, yes, we are talking about just the waste and packaging uh, vertical today. Next slide. Um, and one of the main things we have committed to is 50% um, reduction in food waste by 2030. Uh, we committed to this alongside Amazon a few years ago as part of the U.S. Food Loss and Waste Champions. Um, and we recently independently signed on to uh, Refed's U.S. Food Waste Pact, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but we we are we're doing it <laughs> um and now that we're doing it what are we doing to get there and that's what i'm going to talk a little bit about today next slide please um so the last two years that i've been here have, uh, has been a, a pretty foundational time um we developed an accounting methodology and a baseline for our food waste we developed we defined the metric we're going to be using to measure our food waste which is food waste intensity um, and then we created a very cohesive strategy that's based on this food waste hierarchy you see here on the screen, right? Um, this is uh, in line with the EPA's waste hierarchy, but it really is a way of defining the prioritization of how do we want to handle um, food product and food waste in the most responsible way possible. So after we have this uh, baseline created, our metric defined, and our strategy generally outlined, we wanted to educate all of our team members. Um, so we've got 550 almost stores across the company. We've got 10,000 in-store employees. They need to know. They need to um, get behind the strategy since they are the ones in the front line on in our stores. Um, so we created a couple of different resources, a waste diversion handbook, um, some online tra trainings and engagement, um, and we were able to reach uh, almost 75,000 team members last year with these trainings. Um, and then we also created our green mission program um, of which a significant component is waste education and training. Um, so we've got green mission ambassadors at the vast majority of our stores who help us uh, train folks in the strategy and how that comes to life in our stores. Next slide, please. So drilling down into um, each of the levels of the hierarchy, I'm gonna highlight a couple of key initiatives or focus areas that we're doing in each of these levels of the hierarchy, right? Because it takes a holistic strategy um, to really move the needle on this massive goal. So when we think about decreasing food waste, um, we think about shrink. And for those of you who are not in the grocery industry, um, shrink is our, our inventory or our products that is lost or cannot be sold. And there are a variety of reasons why that might happen, right? There's theft, there's spoilage, there's overordering. Um, if product is damaged during transit, for any other reason, it cannot be sold to our customers on our store floor. Um, that is considered shrink. So to reduce food waste, we must reduce shrink. And how do we do this? Um, there's a couple of key things to think about when you're looking at this area of decrease. Um, we want to monitor over purchasing through better order management tools. We are um, creating a more customer-centric uh, customer assortment 
<laughs> um, which leads to not creating unnecessary waste. We are working with conversion. Um, and that means, you know, think an avocado is slightly too ripe to sell, but we'll make a great guacamole. We make that guacamole in-house and we sell it on our shelves through our own brand. So in-store conversion of whole products to value-added products. Um, that happens in our prepared food section as well for our, our uh, hot bar and salad bar. Um, and then we're looking at, we're looking outside of uh, our four walls and we're bringing in partners to help us maximize this even further. Um, two of those I wanna highlight today, one of them is Too Good To Go and another one is our Enjoy Today program. Next slide, please. So our Too Good To Go program is something that I'm really excited about. If you're not familiar with it, give it a Google, but it's a really simple solution for reducing food waste and driving new customers. Basically, we're able to post our uh, near expiry, but totally edible and wholesome uh, food onto um, this platform that becomes uh, makes it available to the public at a very reduced rate. Um, and it's been going really well so far. We recently just expanded to 300 more stores um, and our team members love it, our customers love it, and it's effectively reducing food waste. So super exciting. Next slide, please. Our other program um, in this same vein is called Enjoy Today. And this is an in-house run program, super simple. Again, basically we are monitoring uh, the products that are uh, about to expire and need to be consumed within a few days. And we're decreasing or we're discounting that by 50%. And we're putting these just, you know, bright yellow stickers on there. Um, and our customers are loving it and it's helping us get that product off of the shelves. Next slide, please. So drilling down into the next area of our strategy, um, you know, often with all these awesome efforts to, to decrease food waste, we still end up with some. And so that's when we're looking to donate, right? That's the next priority. So um, we've got one, uh, one of our major programs at Whole Foods is our food donation program. Next slide, please. And through this program, um, which is longstanding and really beloved by our team members, um, it, we've been able to donate over 33 million pounds of food in 2023. And this is consistent year over year, somewhere between 28 and 33, 35 million pounds a year. And that all goes to local community organizations. Um, we actually serve over 1,000 unique food rescue agencies. Um, all across the U.S., Canada, and um, with our small footprint in the U.K. Um, and this is allowing us to live out our core value of caring about communities and the environment. We're, we're very driven by these core values, um, and this program is a really great way that we connect and support with our community. Next slide, please. Um, and that's not all we do around food donation. We also have uh, something called our Nourishing Our Neighborhoods program. So this is where Whole Foods funds the purchase of refrigerated vans for food recovery organizations across the country. Um, we've donated 50 vans across the US and Canada so far, um, which allows for these agencies to um, rescue more food, keep it fresher and get it to the people who, who need it. So a really great program. We've got no plans of slowing down on those donation numbers. So we're excited about that. Next slide, please. So as much as we decrease and as much as we donate, unfortunately, we still have waste, right? Where your raspberries go moldy in the blink of an eye or a customer drops a huge bag of rice and it breaks open and disposal is your only option. Um, but of course we don't want that going into landfill. Um, and so we utilize composting and anaerobic digestion and animal feed. And as of 2023, we have about 452 stores with some type of food waste diversion program, which is about 85% of our total footprint. Um, through those programs, we were able to divert 87,000 tons of food waste from the landfill. Um, and this year, we're trying to expand that. We're trying to close that gap, um, get those services at all of our stores, and continue to increase the amount that we're able to divert from, from landfill. Next slide, please. Um, and to do that, we needed some help, right? It's a it's a crazy landscape out there for for composting, especially in the U.S. Um, services aren't always available. Um, we just knew that we needed backup on this, 
Um, so we recently brought in a new waste broker um, called Rubicon. And among many improvements, um, they're going to give us the data and insights we need to uh, strategically assess the gaps in our program, right size our existing services, and move towards improvement. Um, and this right sizing is something that we see as really key, right? So we want to only be having, um, we want to have the right services for the type of waste that we are producing. Um, and that in turn will help it get to its most productive uh, next next stage. Um, so we're really excited to start working with Rubicon on that um, a little bit later this year and into next. Next slide, please. So our Code Green program is another uh, key strategic initiative that falls into this diversion category, but in truth, it actually spans throughout the whole strategy. In simplest terms, this program requires our store team members to take a moment and inspect and reflect on the waste before it's tossed into the compactor, right? We know that a trash can or a compactor can be a black hole. You throw it away and you never think about it again. You don't think about where it goes. And so this program encourages our team members to um, take a look at what they're throwing away and look for um, those opportunities to uh, correct ordering mistakes, to donate the edible, eligible edible food that might be in there that mistakenly wasn't donated, um, and to correct mistakes with sortation to make sure that our composting streams, our recycling streams are as clean as possible which supports that healthy circular loop of recycling and composting. Um, the preliminary results from this program um, were, were really positive. So we rolled it out to the rest of our stores um, last year. The lift is quite high for stores, right? This is kind of a big operational change. Um, and so we've got a long runway for adoption here, but we're really looking forward to measuring the full results of this um, later this year and into next. Um, and so far it's it's being met, um, it, it's showing great initial results. So excited to uh, report back later on how that's going. Next slide, please. So all of those things are in service to this massive goal of 50% reduction in food waste by 2030. Um, but even with all of those initiatives, uh, we, we still, we know that it's gonna be a challenge to reach this goal. Um, we have about three years of entitlement mapped out right now with these programs, um, but we know we have to think longer term than that. Um, and so we called in the backup, we phoned a friend and we joined the US Food Waste Pact. Next slide, please. And the pact uh, is run through Refed and World Wildlife Fund. Um, and it's a collaboration amongst industry peers to target, measure, and act to reduce food waste. This is a supportive and supplemental program um, from the U.S. Food Waste and Lost Champions Program, um, really aimed at taking action through collaboration with peers um, and with ReFed and all the resources that they provide. So we joined this in December of last year when it was announced at COP. Um, we're super excited um, to begin. We have begun working with many of the other retailers in this and participating in pilots and programs and research studies. Um, and this is, we see this as a key way that um, we can support the acceleration of these initiatives industry wide outside of our, our four walls. Um, I think that's all I have. Next slide, just make sure. Yep. <laughs> um, so, so that's all we've got. Thank you so much. Um, the Better Buildings for having us. And I, I'll pass it back to you, Bruce. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, I always enjoy learning new things. And I think I've learned that uh, give it a Google is uh, something I'll, I'll take with me from this webinar. Um, so thanks again both, to both of y'all. Those are really insightful presentations, um, things I didn't realize were going on. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Slido hopper. And so I'll just uh, go to that real quick and see you know, uh, what that looks like right now. Um, one question, I think it's possibly for both of y'all is what advice do you have for companies that are starting their waste diversion journey? Oh, there we go. 
I guess I can start off. So I would say um, doing some research in your local area and even beyond that to understand the waste vendors that you have access to. So that in tandem with doing something like a large scale audit or even small scale to really understand all of the types of materials that you have. And ultimately, without having those vendors or customers for those materials, you won't have the opportunity to, ver to divert. And that's not always the easiest thing. Um, so I would say to start with that and then really dive into making it part of your company policy uh, to make sure that you know every person and team member that's a part of your company or your facility is educated and also understands that it is a full company responsibility uh, to commit to waste diversion. Okay. So basically education is a big, is a big key. So thank you, Madeline. Katie? Yeah, or... I couldn't agree more with, with Lacey's points. I think the waste characterization study is really important or waste audit. Um, and the only other thing I'll add is that it's so dependent on, upon uh, behavior change, right? So um, I always like to conduct some sort of listening tour, we call them at Whole Foods, where you're interviewing stakeholders about their interaction with waste today, any problems or opportunities they see, and then building your strategy and programs around that, that will ensure buy-in from folks across the company and synergy with um, their priorities. And that's been the most effective way, I think, of, of building a holistic waste strategy. Perfect. Um, we have one specifically for Lacey. Uh, how easy or difficult was it to achieve the results that you shared? Um, did a lot of the employees participate? So there's a couple of factors there. I will say that when it comes to food waste specifically, and especially our byproducts, that was on the easier side because those materials are truly wanted in the supply chain as animal food ingredients or animal bedding. Um, so that was successful early on. Um, I think, as you heard, we had some difficulty in finding vendors, but also changing vendors uh, when necessary. So I can say that the boots on the ground operations aspect of it um, is a little bit easier when it comes to things like weekly waste audits, daily shift checks, annual audits. But I will say that not everyone is thrilled to dig through a week's worth of trash. So I think that's the harder part is really building the culture that we are doing this for a reason and it will continue to help us uphold our zero waste policy. Okay, great. And Katie, if you want to add, feel free to. No, I think very well said. Okay. Uh, the next question we have here is, what are some innovative types of EnviroSafe packaging that your companies use or will start using? So like biodegradable plastics, for example. Um, so I can start there. Lundberg has trialed a number of bioplastics. Um, and at this point in time, we are in an unfortunate pause when it comes to really going towards packaging changes. And this is because of the EPR or extended producer responsibility legislation that is coming to front. Um, and so we really want to make sure that all of the changes that we make looking forward do align with the regulations that will be coming soon by different states and provinces in Canada. Um, so bioplastics proved positive for us. Um, another kind of story there is we were going to switch to a more readily recyclable rice pouch and chose to do a life cycle analysis on our current packaging compared to that ready to recycle pouch. And we actually found that it had a larger footprint. And so we are definitely committed to life cycle analyses as a standard process because we really want to understand are we making this change for a better impact or, you know, we don't want to change something over a word. And the only thing I can add to that is I, I do think the the life cycle analysis is really important because um, the trade-offs aren't always clear between uh, one packaging option and another. At the surface level, it might appear to be a, a more sustainable option. Um, but if you look at things like the availability of residential composting programs that can accept bioplastics, which is only about 5% of U.S. households have access to that, right? Like that um, should be taken into consideration when you're um, considering what type of package to use. 
So we are looking at all of that as well um, with a with a life cycle type of lens um, and assessing the, the trade-offs. We tread carefully with compostables and we look more towards um, switching products into curbside recyclable, um, but we certainly are also looking at reduction, right? So reduction of plastics, which we know to be just such a pervasive pollutant issue um, is gonna be a big focus for us in the, in the coming years. Terrific. Um, there's one question here about how much revenue increase has Whole Foods seen. I don't know if you're able to speak to that, Katie. Um, I don't have exact numbers, but um, just to, to be transparent, it's not a revenue generating program for us. Um, well, it prevents us from taking a total loss from the loss of that product. Um, it's really a, it's it's a waste reduction initiative that is the drive for for us to to do this, um, and also to better serve. Our customers, right? Uh, giving them the same wholesome, uh, you know, good quality products, but at a lower price point, as opposed to disposing of it, is something that our customers um, are loving. So, really driven by the waste reduction. Okay. Uh, the next one here, it also seems though, uh, for Whole Foods, uh, have you all considered energy generation on site or off site with food waste? So, I'm guessing that would be like an anaerobic digestion type of uh, technology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have. We um, have quite a few um, sites using the Grind to Energy program, which is an on-site anaerobic digestion facility that kind of slurry material is then um, taken off-site for to be run through um, a digestion plant where energy is generated. Um, and we're look, we, we consider that option alongside other composting and animal feed options whenever we're looking at um, food waste diversion options. Perfect. Um, and then there's another question, I guess, also for Katie about restaurants and how eager they were to participate in your Good to Go initiative. Definitely. Um, so, Too Good to Go, I think whoever asked this question is probably familiar with it. Typically, it's um, a, it's a partnership with restaurants where restaurants at the end of the night can give away their or sell at a deep discount their. Um, their extra food. Um, for us, we're not partnering with any restaurants. It's the food, it's the products on our shelves that we are putting into those surprise bags and, and selling at the discount. So we run it for um, our bakery department and our prepared foods department. So it's all done completely within the Whole Foods um, universe. It's it's our products um, then, and you're picking it up directly from our stores. Thank you. Um, another one here asks if there are any initiatives to tackle end user packaging waste, such as bringing back programs for plastic materials for recycling. Um, I think there are some organizations like, for example, Sherwin Williams will take back unused paint, for example, so something in that vein. I don't know if you all have any of that. We're really focused right now um, in these last two years on our, our own footprint. We do have um, some take back programs across the company. Um, and I think we're looking at how to strategically move those forwards um, in a way that supports what our customers want and expect from grocery retailers. Um, and we are also looking at um, just our, our, our own footprint and our own product packaging. Perfect. And I don't know, Lacey, if you want to chime in on that one or not, or... I would say from the food manufacturing point, um, I did mention something like a consumer program like TerraCycle, um, but really the most readily available program is called How to Recycle. You may have seen those labels on various products like bread bags and things like that, um, where retailers will have a bin that you can bring back those pieces of packaging, but maybe the plastic bags from their stores and produce bags and whatnot. Um, that is what I have the most visibility to as far as a bring back program for food packaging. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another one here asks about how does Whole Foods take into account different states' ability to recycle certain plastics? So that's navigating the patchwork of, of state and local, I guess, regulations. It's a great question and it's very difficult. Um, but um, we, to Lacey's point about how to recycle, this is a, a system that we rely heavily on to help us navigate the 
the state and local level uh, differences between what's recyclable and not recyclable. Um, and so we are in the process of um, taking information about all of the packaging we use for our exclusive brands products today and measuring it against the how to recycle standard to understand the recyclability of our current portfolio. And I think from there, that will inform our strategy for um, you know, better label, better on pack labeling of of our product packaging, um, and hopefully the uh, you know the actual products, the product packaging that we use, trying to more align with what is commonly recyclable um, in the majority. So we do. It's it's something you can't really tackle on a on a one to one um, situation. So organizations like How to Recycle, also the Recycling um, Partnership have great resources that kind of help you understand the larger the larger landscape. Okay, great. And I don't know, Lacey, if you want to speak to, I think y'all are based in California. Are there any resources or regulations that that uh, help facilitate uh, you know recycling or anything? Um, we are in an interesting place because we're in a very rural area um, in Northern California. And so when it comes to our state's availability, it really is kind of far from us when it comes to industrial waste. And that's really unfortunate um, when it comes to our post-industrial, but not post-consumer packaging. Um, as far as the different states' ability to recycle or even compost certain packaging, it is rather difficult to follow the resources available in different states, but even different parts of states. Um, and so just really echoing what Katie had to say there and understanding not only from how to recycle guidance, but also the FTC green guides, um, you know, what materials are generally recyclable in a majority of places. So it's pretty difficult. Um, one question here asks if you've seen initiatives and engage suppliers to reduce upstream waste. And I've got a follow-up question to that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if everyone was at the, um, the summit this past spring, but one of the questions or ideas that came out of the waste session there was that there were some haulers that were not recycling, even though they were picking things up that should have gone to a recycling you know, type of plant. Um, and, you know, I think that is a part of the supply chain. Um, and I don't know if y'all have seen any uh, evidence of that happening or what you've done to perhaps prevent that from happening. But first of all, let's, let's go ahead and engage the, uh, the, do the question with engaging suppliers to reduce upstream waste. So I can, I can start on that one. Um, obviously we have a very large number of suppliers, um, here at Whole Foods, um, we also have very close relationships with a lot of them. Um, so we work hand in hand with them on um, all types of things, sustainability, waste, carbon included. Um, so I think we um, we recently published our packaging guidelines um, and that's those are available to suppliers which kind of show um, our preferences and priorities around um, packaging and how that contributes to waste. I think we also seek to amplify um, the good work that suppliers are already doing around waste reduction. And I think upcycling is an important part as well, right? Many of our the products on our shelves are um, either upcycled certified or use upcycled ingredients. And so we see that as a key um, strategy that our suppliers can use to uh, reduce the waste on their portion of the, the supply chain. And I can add to that a little bit. We really are diving headfirst into understanding our supply chain emissions at this time. And so we are trying to engage on all upstream emissions and whatnot. Um, but when it comes to upstream waste, the kind of best thing that I can speak to at this time is we have focused on kind of buying in bulk the best that we can, whether we're talking about packaging, ingredients, anything like that, um, and ultimately reducing the materials that we are receiving. Um, that has worked in a couple of ways to kind of uh, encourage suppliers to package 
larger cases of ingredients and things like that. So as a vertically integrated company, you know, we are receiving some ingredients for our products and of course packaging, but most of the waste happens right here. We are part of our own supply chain. Okay, terrific. Um, and I don't know if y'all have any sense yet for <clears throat> the, the question I posed about, uh, you know, the waste haulers and, you know, how you work with them, how, how they, they perform, that kind of thing. I can start there. Um, there's a couple of different things. So we have some waste vendors or customers, depending on the material, that are willing to provide us life cycle analyses when it comes to their operations directly. Um, so really showing the end of life of the materials that we are providing to them. Um, and then in addition to that, we definitely have very strict vendors when it comes to contamination. And so, like I said, most of our vendors are only okay with that 1% contamination. Um, for example, we had a bale of clear plastic, which is mostly our pallet wrap from here. And there was a small amount of rust from our baler that was on that bale just on the side. And that was rejected and sent to landfill. And so that's really the best visibility that we have is our vendors and customers providing those data, but also um, being honest in the sense of rejecting materials if it was contaminated in any way. Terrific, thanks. And just to add to that, this is something I'm, I'm passionate about. And yes, we do come in contact with situations, Bruce, where what we expected was being recycled is not actually. Um, and sometimes that's due to contamination and sometimes that's due to a host of other reasons um, outside of our control. I think I'm very, um, I'm a big proponent of building in this this kind of consideration into contracts with haulers um, to to uh, help with accountability and transparency and reporting, right? Structure your contract so that this is a key part of the agreement between you and the hauler. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of the resource management style contracting. Um, if you haven't heard of that before, it's, it's just kind of a, a more beneficial way of approaching a hauler client relationship. Um, and I think this is one of the major reasons we we brought Rubicon on as well, right? Our agreement with them is um, that they will help us oversee and hold all of our individual haulers accountable, right? We've got so many across all of our stores. It's it's too much for us to oversee. Um, so we brought in the partner to to help be the the kind of enforcer of of, of those standards. Okay, great. I like that, the enforcer. Well, I think that's going to do it for the Q&A session today. Um, I do want to close with a few uh, final remarks. Uh, number one, I'd love to you know just thank our both of our presenters uh, for some great uh, presentations and some really insightful answers uh, during the Q&A session. Um, I do want to remind folks that uh, this is one webinar out of an entire series of summer, summer webinars. Uh, so we hope that you'll join us in the future for the webinars that are coming up. Um, including water reuse technologies will be the next one uh, that is being done by Andrew Whitlock, uh, one, of our part, uh, one of our colleagues there. Um, I also like to thank all the participants who came and stayed and asked questions. Um, also, if you are you didn't get your question asked, you know, please uh, go ahead. We have some, uh, I think the last slide should have our contact information. So if you want to get back in touch with us and, and ask some questions, you know, we're certainly able to, to address them right there. Um, we also want to encourage folks to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and X, formerly known as Twitter, um, and see what new things are coming out. We usually have a lot of LinkedIn posts that talk about partner achievements, updates to programs and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, you'll probably get a email at the end of um, today's uh, you know, recording with the slides and transcript that are, will be available uh, you know, uh, if so, uh, you're interested in that, uh, please uh, follow that. Um, and I think with that, uh, we're at 11.59, so I'll go ahead and close it today. Uh, oh, here you go. There's the, the slide with all uh, our questions or our, our, our contact information. Uh, so as I said, you know, these will be made available. Uh, so please be patient. Uh, it will take another week or two. Uh, but in, if you, in the in interim, uh, go ahead and, and email us if you have any further questions. So thanks again, Lacey and Katie. 
Uh, we definitely look forward to working with you all and helping you reduce waste in the future. And um, we'll hopefully see you again soon. So. Thank you.